I can't imagine being Stephanie Munson Dahl. She's the city of Asheville's urban design and place strategies manager, and that means she pretty much knows what's going on with practically every development in town. On a day-to-day -day basis, it looks like a lot of project management, the Pack Square Plaza visioning project, we're considering a redoing Eagle Street. We're helping out with alternative designs for the Duke substation. We are looking at how to work with NCDOT to knit together the I-26 connector. Every day, we're looking at a plethora of issues that are facing people in real time. I'm Matt Pikin. My guest today is Stephanie monson -Dahl. Her knowledge is exhaustive, and so is her energy for the nuts and bolts of city planning. Over the next half hour or so, she'll give you the lowdown on the reimagining of Pack Square, keeping West Asheville pedestrian-friendly, and the challenges of bringing North Merriman Avenue into the 21st century. Advertisements don't sound like ads on the Overlook. They sound like conversations, because they are. Take it from one of my earliest sponsors, Jennifer Goodier of Davidia Realty. That was really easy, and I felt really comfortable doing this ad with you. And I'm enjoying it so much that I do want to buy more. If you market a business, or even yourself, make a great impression by advertising on Asheville's hottest show. You can be a sponsor of The Overlook for as little as $100. Ask to learn more by messaging me at matt at podavl.com. That's P-O-D-A-V-L dot com. I began my conversation by asking Stephanie about the Pack Square Plaza, Block E, and Eagle Street projects, and whether the connections between them are influencing their directions. Oh, absolutely. Context is everything. As a good planner, you actually ascribe to a set of principles where you have to take in this larger context of being interconnected. So while I mentioned those geographies, it's really important to say also that downtown and the block, that whole section that is having a renaissance and re-emerging is really historically part of the East End neighborhood. And the East End neighborhood, most people in Asheville might not even know where that is, but it's just east of downtown and it has a lot of history. But making sure that neighborhood, which is what we would call a legacy neighborhood, it's historically African-American, it faces a lot of gentrification pressures, we also have to take that kind of stuff in context and look at neighborhood resiliency and anti-displacement strategies every time we're doing something next door. You just mentioned something about the gentrification that is happening around Block E and your department's efforts to be mindful and protect the legacy of that neighborhood, what capacities do you have to stem some of the tide of, of gentrification when, at least from an outside looking in, it seems your hands are tied a little bit in terms of what you can enforce on developers, what you can enforce on private construction and development? What, how do you shape these projects when, at least legally, your options are limited? Or am I wrong in reading it that way? You are not wrong. You're very correct in saying, our hands are not tied. I'd say I would not phrase it that way. But you are not wrong in saying that the city can't magically create policies or just do something that is going to stop the stem of displacement or gentrification, however you want to describe that. But the city does have a lot of influence. So the city can zone properties so that certain things can only happen there. The city also has a significant amount of money to use towards affordable housing development, I'll say. So this is a little bit different than displacement or gentrification, but we can support new developers who are looking at saying, for sure, I will keep this multifamily development affordable to maybe there's 20 units perhaps that are affordable to people making 60% of the a AMI and I'll do that for 20 or 30 years. The city is able to provide them financial incentives that make that work for the developer. So we're looking at a lot of other strategies and I would say we have partners in the community from Buncombe County, the Dogwood Health Trust that are meeting and right now with different neighborhoods to talk about what these strategies could look like. They could look anything like developing a pattern book that shows new developers. When you come in here and you build a house, we want you to try to build it in this way so that it fits into the character and this 
neighborhood isn't seen as rapidly changing in a place for everybody to plant their out of state pot of money, things like that. But what I wanted to comment on most of all was your astute recognition that the city is not going to be able to stop this. And I met with one of the more recent heads of the American Planning Association, and that person said the real root cause of gentrification, it's private activity. And in, I don't think it's a, I don't want to say this in a damning way or anything, but when everybody in the city of Asheville or in Buncombe County sees all this money coming in and sells their house for twice that it was worth on the tax rolls, it's going to have an incredible effect on the neighborhood and on housing prices moving forward. You mentioned something about that developing single family homes is something you're trying to deter, right? Oh, I wouldn't say that, but we are trying to broaden the options for people and remind people that single family homes are really a product of a post-World War II kind of change in culture and that for hundreds of years before that, and there was just a much more diverse set of housing typologies for us, whether whatever stage of life that you're in, instead of single family home, which doesn't work very well for a lot of people, single people who are elderly, people who have lower incomes. It should work, but we also have this American dream that you're going to create wealth by buying this single family home. And that also shouldn't be the only way that we can guarantee a source of wealth for people. So what we're seeing here, and from just observationally, and tell me if this is something that strategically you and your department are looking to encourage, are more high density urban development, such as lower level retail, upper level residential, Yes. Developments. Where, what are we seeing that is representing that vision? What kind of developments are happening hmm. or coming around the corner that you think really represent where you want to see the city go? So I would point out, I think it's called Radview Lofts in the River Arts District. It used a very interesting development site. It's not something a lot of people would have chosen to develop because it's small and hamstrung on different sides, but the bottom line is that the developer was able to do a mix of retail, office, and residential uses in a really small spot and take advantage of like creating the type of infill that we needed in the River Arts District. Most people don't know in the River Arts District, there's very few housing units within the core of the district itself. It's really in the adjacent neighborhoods like we can in Southside and West Asheville where you see that residential and we need that there. So that's, a, I think, you know, a small but recent and great example of how you fit something into an existing site and capitalize on creating a really walkable neighborhood. How did that happen? Was that a private developer who just had that vision or did you, were you working with a developer to help shape that? Both, but I would say it was not a huge intentional partnership between the city and this developer. What I would advocate is when the city makes investments in places like the River Arts District and says we're going we're gonna to put in the first protected bike lane in the city and change the stormwater system so that it doesn't flood as much, we're going to create sidewalks so that you can walk everywhere, it induces the kind of development that wants to be right there. So some pieces of development in the area, foundation, the foundy and all of that down there, it's 14 acres. That was much more of a, what I would say is an active discussion and dialogue between the city and private developers about what's going to happen. What are you going to do? How is this going to work? We're going to invest here because you're building this beautiful greenway and it's going to help us with our retail right next door. Whereas the other piece I was just talking about was like the engine was already turning. The same thing happened in downtown. The downtown development story, a lot of people don't talk about the city's role in it, but the city set up a downtown development office and created public-private partnerships on the early stage of revitalization. It would answer any questions that de developers had, look at real specific things like most people don't know that some of the parking decks that came around in the 1990s, I believe, that was the city staff talking to developers and them saying, we would love to revitalize downtown. Please put up some parking garages so that people have places to park that are not on street. That's a partnership. I didn't know that the city had that role in the 90s, it was taking an active role. I, I always hear about 
just individual maverick people coming to the rescue. Julian and, and, Price, mm-hmm. yeah, that's one. Roger McGuire, John Cram, those people, John Lancius, those people deserve a lot of credit, but shout out to Leslie Anderson, who was the downtown development director at the time. The city manager was astute enough to realize that someone needed to wake up every day and help people figure out how they could do things and identif- you know, identify a new law that needed to be passed liquor by the drink and it enabled outdoor dining and it meant that all of a sudden people would come downtown and enjoy their birthday or anniversary dinner outside and have a glass of wine old-fashioned something like that so there were a lot of things like that happened only with the city's help and it's a part of the story people don't i'll say that i think it's unsung the role of local government, not just city government, but local government and making things happen in people's lives that are really positive. I understand why it's unsung and I tip my hat to those private investors as well. Sticking with the theme of downtown, getting back over to Block E, where are some of your successes and where are some of your challenges right now in terms of bringing up that area for newer residents and keeping it honoring the legacy of that neighborhood. So the block is a really interesting place. While it's historically a black neighborhood, it was the black commercial district. And a lot of the folks will even say, we didn't feel like it was part of downtown. It really is a part of downtown now. So that's the first thing I want to put out there is how we have to think about what it feels like as a geography. It's right outside of Pack Square. So one of the challenges is just that the The difference between the people who have been around and know the stories for the last 50 years and the people that are there now that are running the Noir Collective, which is the Black Artists Co-op Workshop that's in the YMI building, they're different people. And so I think some of the challenges are making sure that you're hearing both of those historical voices that you're talking about to understand the legacy. And you're also respecting what this new group of people who is multicultural are trying to do in the district. And it's a, it's a knitting together of those two streams. In what ways are you seeing these different populations? Where are some of the friction points between the old and the new? One thing that's really clear to us that are working in the city with these groups is that there is a priority from some of the older generation, and this is true of any neighborhoods, to get their stories told, to have the legacy written down, and to prioritize investments in that and in honoring the legacy of what has happened. Whereas for people who are, I mean, 50 sounds old, okay? I know that. (laughs) But honestly, compared to a 75 or 80 year old, that's but so let's just say, I don't know, 40 and younger. Or something. Age, age is relative. Yeah, yeah. For the younger generation, they're looking at the future. And so the investments they want the city and county to make, they're just not always the same. They're really about their businesses thriving, about making making sure that new people can come in, whereas maybe the older generations are about keeping things the same so that they can preserve what they had. There is some tension there, but there's also a lot of connectivity. So I think going back to affordability, that is a connection point that everyone is concerned on. And that's where we try to bring things together. Public safety is another one of those things. We're hearing about it a lot lately, all over the city of Asheville. People have concerns about it. And so that is a point for people to come together. You touched on a few different things that also are factors with Pack Square Plaza reimagining. All those things play into that. And I know from the beginning, you were trying to be very conscious of doing something that would have decades of resonance, that however Pack Square is reimagined, that the changes resonate for decades to come with people. That's a tall order in a way. You don't want to keep reimagining that plaza every five years. Maybe you do though, Matt. Really? Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that we looked at when we started this process was that it has been reimagined over 20 years. If you look at it over time first, you know, it was just this kind of old log cabin point, meeting place or what have you. And then you get to where you are today, where the Vance Monument is being removed. But every 20 years, there's been a reinvestment that changes the actual design. And when design has changed, it changes the actual use of the plaza area. So we do, so what I'll say is you, you are right, but it is broader. We wanted 
create something for the community that is 20 years from now and 50 years from now. So this is an aspirational planning process. It's not just looking at what people wanna have right now. It's really putting what we've heard from youth and other folks about the future, not future two years from now, forward. And at the same time, I think it would be a terrible thing if our community keeps putting on this, it's not really a hair shirt, but some kind of cloak that says, we just did that. We just reinvested in that area. And it's, yeah, it's our central public plaza. And it's not, it's not like Central Park, this giant park that over time has essentially re kept to the same bones where you have the meadow and you have the ramble. It's a much smaller space, and so it has to be more dynamic. The, inside of Central Park in New York, there's little pieces that become dynamic over time. But for Pack Square, it's like, we gotta pack it all in. But you couldn't do all that and then have an eye on, oh, we can reimagine it five years from now and keep all this is money and time. I, oh, imagine, yeah. I would think that's a constricting nature on what you're doing. You just don't wanna keep spending money and going through this process every five or even every 10 years to reimagine, to draw a clean slate and start over. Yes. And so the trick with that is how can you do things that are sleek or streamlined? How can you do things that are tactical, that can change the way a public space works without spending five million? And in this case, what we're looking at with Pack Square Visioning is, okay, this is a 20 year time horizon for what we think 20, 25 year time horizon for like, let's become this kind of public space in the future. But let's also take two to seven years to become that space. Let's not set up the expectation with a community that we create this plan, we raise $15 million, and then we go out and do it, and then we do it again in five years. The things that we're kind of talking about are not major changes in the uses that are already there, but they are changes to the design and their reactions to, specifically to, the things we've heard from the community about how the space doesn't work for them. A great example is teens. Teens don't really feel welcome there. They don't feel like the programming in the park, which is not a design feature at all, but we have design features that support programming. They don't feel like the programming are things necessarily that they wanna go out to all the time. So the city, this past year, we had a really cool thing with Parks and Rec, like a Halloween after party for teens or something. There are ways for us to make these adjustments that are not huge financial lifts. We've also heard that the space on the north side of Pack Square is just dead space and you don't, there's nothing that draws you to it. So when we think about what kind of space it would be, how can we think about making sure that teens or other groups that we heard that are not really interested in coming will now feel like they want to come? What answers have you come up with or have they come forward yet? So we did develop 21 themes, I'll tell you that. And the community advisor committee, which consists of about 13 people, a diverse group of people from across Buncombe County, approved those themes about two weeks ago. And the types of things that we are looking at include elevating people's understanding of this is a place for free speech. So when we talked to people, we really understood that. Some people felt like they're maybe the space that was dedicated or feels dedicated for free speech is tiny and maybe it's taken up by a certain group on a regular basis. And maybe we need to rethink how it becomes a more integral part of the park. So we have a lot of different ideas like that. And on April 17th, we're gonna be re releasing a draft vision plan and then asking the community to respond to it. The Overlook is a daily podcast. And while I'd love for you to make the show a daily habit, I know you might have to stack up your episodes for a long drive. That's why you should sign up for the Overlook's weekly newsletter. Every Friday, get all the episodes from the past five days right in your inbox. Just go to podavl.com, P-O-D-A-V-L.com, and find the newsletter link to sign up. At the end of the last segment, Stephanie said it could take two to seven years just to plan for a given project. I commented that seven years seems like a long time before breaking any ground. It turns out Stephanie and I work on different timelines. Maybe my, my sense of time is so different because when I work on these initiatives in local government, they take a lot of time. Mm. We 
like to go slow and make sure that the community has been engaged and that the current city council is up to date on things. And we like to diversify our financial streams so that the city isn't overburdened. So developing those kind of partnerships takes time. And it's not short for certain populations, but in the span of a life of a city, it's teeny. And when I think about my, my earlier work with the city, all focused or mostly focused on riverfront redevelopment. And every time I think about how long that took, but people think that one day they woke up and there was just this beautiful greenway there, a new nine acres of new park space. And these that, that took over 10 years to really work on that. You know, the first piece of work that we did in earnest, getting brownfield redevelopment grants so that we could clean up some of these spaces that no one wanted to be on was in 2008. And then you just saw, it was lovely to see during the pandemic that all this new open space opened up at a time when people really needed it and really craved it. And plug for public spaces right there and why Pack Square is important. But that is a long time. Yeah. And when you put it that way too, we really lack public spaces in this community in that way. We are building out, I think, some underutilized public spaces and have plans to develop more. So what I would, what I think is you've got this Haywood and Page master plan for downtown, for example, and I'm going to give both a in-town and bourbon example. The idea is there, the community came around it, and right now it is sitting underutilized. We've tried a variety of temporary uses for that site, but it does take money. So my takeaway on this is that public space does take investment, and what we don't have here that a lot of other communities have is a public space advocate. So the best public space advocate I can think of off the top of my head right now is Connect Buncombe. They do a great job and they are focused on one aspect of public space. It's an important one because it connects all of our other public spaces. What are we seeing other communities have in terms of an advocate for public space that we don't have? So the first thing is that many places will have a public-private partnership in some kind of form, whether it's through a foundation that helps raise money for new public spaces or the maintenance of existing public spaces whether it is an advocacy group that helps program public spaces, because public spaces are great. And yes, some public spaces can kind of self-program. People will just create the programming, like buskers in downtown on sidewalks, right? But it's not ab without design as well. We worked on that piece. But having someone that can help program those spaces. And then you have the ultimate model is a conservancy. And so in other cities, and it's not just big cities, most people know about the Central Park Conservancy, which is an organization that almost 100% runs Central Park. People think New York City has a ton of parks, thousands of parks, but they're not the they're not the group that's getting up every day and making sure that it's clean, that there are public restrooms, what the policy is on putting new monuments and memorials in the space are. And that's something that I think we desperately need here. I think we desperately need people to realize that social infrastructure in our public spaces are just as important in a different way, agreeably, when you don't have water, that is a, it's a life need that is probably more important than being able to sit on a park bench with somebody on a daily basis. Yeah. But that social infrastructure is just as important. And without it, we become almost any other city. Are we becoming more challenged to find those people who are interested and invested in that when we're having a lot of people move here later in life and their investment in this city is different than people who've lived here a long time. I can say that the people that work in these kinds of fields feel like it is really difficult. And what I mean by these kinds of fields, it's organizations like Greenworks and Riverlink and the city of Asheville folks that are trying to wake up every day and make great public spaces. It feels like it is really hard to activate the people that are here and that as much as we look on the outside, we're this really wealthy community and we should be able to afford all these things that from the inside, it looks like we can't raise that kind of money to be in that realm. This is a different topic. How we're challenged as a city to draw the kinds of corporations that bring highly paid, highly educated workforce into a community when they're younger, like cities like Denver and a lot of other cities and Austin are seeing and younger people to get invested in their community who are making enough money to where philanthropy becomes part of their lives. We don't have that workforce here. 
I hear that a lot as well. I think that it is correct, but I think it is only part of the issue. It certainly it makes us different from, say, Greenville, South Carolina, which is very close by, or Charlotte, North Carolina, whose main industry is finance. Right. <laughs> so they are both places which have improvement districts. I think Charlotte has 11 of them. Wow. And we have zero. And we have a community that feels very torn about having some kind of municipal service district that's activated to support places like the River Arts District or downtown, which are special districts, honestly. Define business improvement district. A business improvement district is basically an area in which people come together and partner in a very, very official way to create a level of service there. And what I mean by that is providing information to people, making sure that things are green and clean or some of the backbones of this, providing those additional level services in area, including programming like the downtown association might do to ensure that it may become, that it really is a special place and it is maintained as a special place. The kicker being that those people all contribute money in some way, shape or form. So there is an additional tax that levy that is levied for that district. And so it has to be something that the community agrees to. We already have a municipal service district boundary for places like downtown, but we don't actually have that group of people who have worked with city council to agree on what that tax would be. One other thing that's important is to say, it's not just about taxing. I say it's a partnership because churches usually pay voluntarily into this to be supportive and local government and other entities, not-for-profit organizations usually come to the table. And it's a way to, to tie this back to what you're saying about the corporate giving, since we don't have that, and what we have is a collection of really awesome, creative, small entrepreneurs and business owners throughout our city. You know, what this enables people to do is empower themselves to create the type of place they want it to be and not feel like that they are victimized and waiting for the city or the county to step up and solve the issue of people being unhoused or right. all of that. Everything seems to be happening on a very entrepreneurial ad hoc basis. Before I let you go, there are two neighborhoods I want you to get your sense of what we can expect going forward. And they seem to both have very contrasting needs. Haywood Street in West Asheville, where a lot of people want to see it untouched, keep it, keep it weird, keep it funky. And then there's North Asheville and Merriman, and people want to see a lot of change, like these old dilapidated strip malls. Mm. And I, that seems to be ripe for kind of redevelopment of more contemporary, lower level retail, and then having residences above where right now we have lots of open parking areas and older strip malls. Talk about first West Asheville and Haywood and what your department is doing there in working with neighborhoods and business owners to keep it or mm. not as it is. So those two places are great examples because they're very different. Historically, West Asheville was its own city. It developed as a traditional Main Street corridor. Merriman was developed as a traditional auto-oriented corridor. And so that's why you see the two different development styles at, di at different times. So something else I want to point out is that the ownership patterns, they really dictate how a place is going to be developed. And they are very different in these areas as well. So on Merriman Avenue, you're going to see large swaths of property owned by kind of legacy property owners or developers, real estate brokers who manage those spaces and have a vested interest in keeping them auto-oriented because that's what they know. That's what they've already developed there. On Hayward Road, a project that the North Carolina Department of Transportation is spearheading that's going to allow the city to facilitate with the community a lot of spot pedestrian safety improvements along the entire, like maybe at least a mile corridor for the area. And it's something that we had been meeting with the community with for five years ago or more. So the, again, this time span of how long it takes to get things done, we're really excited to see NCDOT come to the table and say, we've got this money, we care about pedestrians. Now let's take what you guys have learned, meet with a community and go out and do that. So we're doing that. The second thing is related to legacy neighborhoods. And we are communicating more often with the Burton Street neighborhood than we are with any of the other residential groups in that area, 
working with them on the mitigation strategies for the I-26 projects, continuing to look at the plan that they created with the knowing that was coming and trying to see where we can implement certain pieces of that. That's our other main priority from the planning and urban design department's perspective is what I'll say there. And then the last thing about that area I'll say is that they were the most innovative in creating a, what we call a form based code for the area. So that area and along the entire corridor, they've already dictated what they wanted to see for a new development and it will be in keeping. It will be very much in keeping with the corridor. There's not going to be huge transformation except for the support for infill development that we, you know, that used to build on the already mixed use district that it is. People will walk up along that corridor. It's a place, by the way, that teens love to visit of all kinds, and and they are close to a park, the, in, in several parks in West Asheville. Merriman Avenue, totally different story. We also worked with the NCDOT on, you know, what people want to call the road diet, however you want to characterize it, and it is changing the way people think about Merriman Avenue. And we are trying to implement pieces of our comprehensive plan that address that corridor. And this is, you know, what we heard from the community, but also... Again, it's looking at the public health, safety, and welfare of that community. You've got to be able to walk without being subject to a fatality. You do need to be able to get back and forth to businesses and commute, get to your school. We are respectful for all of those things as well. But we know that as Asheville grows, that corridor needs to be less suburban and more walkable. So suburban is fine, right? We all, most people want to live in suburbia. Not me, but... (laughs) Okay, most people really do. If you look at housing preferences and what have you, and they always come out and say, oh, younger people over 60 is now moving back into urban areas. That's great. But for the rest, there's this whole huge part of people, the middle of people's lives where they want a house and a yard. But just getting back to what Merriman Avenue could look like in the future, there is a lot of opportunity in that corridor to have that kind of mixed use walkability, at least at nodes. If not, that corridor is a long corridor yeah. and it connects, it connects to Woodfin, which, you know, is a fast growing town, fastest growing town in our area for sure. And it connects to Weaverville. So we have to be conscientious of the long-term development of it, but knowing that the property ownership in the area for those large parcels are controlled many times by people who have a legacy interest in being auto-oriented, it's going to be slower. I want to thank my guest today, Stephanie monson Dahl, urban planner and design strategist with the city of Asheville. If you have thoughts about today's topic, I'd love to hear them and maybe pull them into a future episode of The Overlook. Just leave a voice message on our recorded line, 984-278-7301. Today's conversation happened inside the BB Theater in downtown Asheville, which owners Susan and Giles Collard have been so gracious enough to open to me to record my interviews. Our theme music for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes courtesy of the Asheville band The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes are online by 6 a.m. every weekday, wherever you get your podcasts. Sign up for our weekly newsletter at podavl.com. I'm Matt Pikin, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook.